Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about hypoxemic hypoxemia and we'll understand how hypoventilation causes hypoxia. We talked about the various causes of hypoxia in our previous lecture and in the subsequent series of lectures we'll talk about each of these causes and understand them. So why does hypoventilation cause hypoxia? In a normal alveoli you have got nitrogen, you got water vapor and you have carbon dioxide and oxygen. If this alveoli does not exchange its air, the carbon dioxide will keep on increasing the alveoli and the levels of oxygen will keep on dropping as the exchange happens. The nitrogen and water vapor are in equilibrium in the blood, so their levels will not change. So if your carbon dioxide level in your alveoli rises, the proportion of the oxygen molecules in that alveoli are going to drop and that results in hypoxia. Carbon dioxide levels increase for two reasons. First reason is obviously the increased production. The second one, which is the most common, is decreased alveolar ventilation. If you understand from your previous lecture, the alveolar ventilation is the part of the gas that participate in the gas exchange. So if you are inhaling a tidal volume, the part of it remains in your anatomical dead space, that's around 150 cc's. Some of it will go to the alveoli, which have a good exchange, but some of it might go to the alveoli, which have a poor exchange. There's no blood flow to these areas, so there cannot be any oxygen or carbon dioxide change. In a normal person, the physiological dead space is almost zero, but in certain disease state like COPD, this can be pretty large. Alveolar carbon dioxide and the CO2 in the capillaries, there's a pretty good exchange rate between them. Now, alveolar ventilation depends upon your minute ventilation, how much of your tidal volume goes in how much minute, and the fraction that is going to the dead space. So if you subtract the dead space from one, that's the proportion, and multiply by the minute ventilation, you get the alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation would decrease if you've got a decreased minute ventilation. It will also decrease if your proportion of the dead space ventilation increases. And the dead space we are talking about is the physiological dead space and not the anatomical dead space. So we already know that the alveolar oxygen levels depend upon how much you inspire and the level of the CO2. So in a normal person, your partial pressure of inspired oxygen is around 150, your alveolar CO2 is around 40. So your alveolar PaO2 is around 110, which exchanges pretty well with the capillaries. So their P arterial O2 is also 110, and that gives you saturation of 100%. Let's drop the alveolar ventilation by 50%. So that would mean that you will double up your carbon dioxide levels in your alveoli, and now when you are inspiring the same 20% oxygen, CO2 is much higher at 80, and when you subtract from it, your PaO2 will be 70, and that would correspond to somewhere 90%. One of the things that you already noticed that even by halving the alveolar ventilation, your SpO2 has not dropped significantly, and your SATs are pretty okay. If you drop your ventilation further, your P alveolar CO2 will continue to increase, subsequently dropping your PaO2. So hypoxemia is a relatively late feature of hypoventilation. Your CO2 levels have to be very high before you see the hypoxia. For every one millimeter rise in PaCO2, you will see that there will be one millimeter drop in PaO2 if your respiratory quotient is one. We'll talk about respiratory quotient in one of the lectures. If you give these patients oxygen, your partial pressure of oxygen are now increased. They are not 150, they are not 240. And even if your alveolar CO2 is 100, you see that your P alveolar O2 is now 140, and that will give you SATs of 100%. So hypoventilation responds very well to increasing FiO2. For one millimeter rise in inspired PiO2 will result in one millimeter rise in P arterial O2. One of the things that you have to notice that your PaCO2 still remains the same, so your patient will still be obtended. So whenever you see a person with hypercapnia, 
you have to think about the respiratory center and how the respiratory center connects to the muscles. Any problem in the whole pathway will result in hyperventilation. Commonest causes that you see in the hospital will be depression of the respiratory center and it can be from the medication such as opiates and barbiturate or stroke or bleed in that area. You can have cervical injury where you have severed the connection of respiratory center with the diaphragms. You can have problem with the phrenic nerve which translates the information from the respiratory center down to the diaphragm level. So any problem in its pathway, for example, mediastinal mass or tumor, things like bullion barre syndrome, diphtheria, affect the nerve and can cause hyperventilation. You can have problem with the neuromuscular junction, muscles strength and problem with the thoracic case like kyphosis. Let's talk a little bit about hyperventilation from increased dead space. So here we have got two different patients, one with a dead space ventilation around 50% and the other one is normal. Now the CO2 is very quickly exchanged between capillaries and alveoli. So the CO2 is able to come into the alveoli pretty quickly. However, you need the ventilation to get them out. So you've seen a normal person, your CO2 can be washed out pretty well. However, in the patient with dead space, since half of the tidal volume is going into the dead space ventilation, your clearance of CO2 from the normal alveoli is also reduced, resulting in hypercapnia. The first and foremost important thing is when you think about hyperventilation, your carbon dioxide levels have to be elevated. So you have to get a ABG to prove that. Most of the hypercapnia happens from depression in the respiratory center and its pathway to the diaphragm. So do a good neurological exam. Look for the altered mental status, for neurological deficits, muscle tones. Also do a good respiratory exam and you're looking at the respiratory rate paradoxical movement of your abdominal muscles. You auscult for the signs of COPD and look for signs of hyperinflation and chest wall anomalies. One of the things that you have to not notice the respiratory rate a little bit more closely. If it is from the decreased minute ventilation, your rates would be low. However, some people would be having a normal respiratory rate and be hypercapnic. And these are the patients who have increased their dead space ventilation. Always look at the medication list and the recent medications given. Opiates can cause respiratory center depression by themselves. However, in obese patients with hyperventilation syndrome, any medication or any sedatives will make them sleep and will cause a rise in CO2 levels. Treatment is based on three principles. You treat the underlying cause, you treat hypoxemia, and you treat hypercapnia. To treat the underlying cause, you have to go through a differentials for hypercapnia as we had described in the previous slides. What I try to do is to figure out whether I am dealing with decreased minute ventilation or increased dead space ventilation. And the easiest way to figure this out is to look at the respiratory rate of the patient and that would give you some idea about what you are dealing with. While in the hospital, think about the acute causes. So for example, a patient with a diaphragmatic palsy in the past. Certainly that can predispose him to be hypercapnic, but that possibly is not the underlying cause. So think about acute changes, things like any new medications, new stroke, new injury to the cervical column, things like myasthenia exacerbation or guillain barre syndrome. Hypoxemia is very easily treated. As we talked about, it responds very well to giving higher FiO2. And you can use either nasal cannula, nasal mask, or high fluid nasal cannula. To treat hypercapnia, let's talk about the first cause of the hypercapnia from decreased tidal volume. And this can come from any of the differentials that we discussed previously. The easiest way to increase the tidal volume is to increase the driving pressure. We can use that by using a bi-level or BiPAP. As you increase the driving pressure, you can give the patient high tidal volume. That means what you are doing is increasing the difference between inspiratory pressures and the expiratory pressures that would result in higher tidal volumes and that would increase the minute ventilation and thus reduce hypercapnia. The hypercapnia from decreased respiratory rates are usually from CNS depression. You can certainly give them BiPAP because it will give them high tidal volume, but do not expect their respiratory rates to rise. Non-invasive ventilation does not significantly increase the respiratory rates in this patient. 
you can try to reverse the CNS depression from the medications that may have been given to these patients. Things like naloxone for opiates and flumazenil for benzodiazepines. Both the respiratory rate and tidal volumes, they drop together in any patient with hypercapnia. You have hypercapnia from increased dead space ventilation and this happens mostly in patients with COPD who have increased air trapping. However, patients with pulmonary embolism also have dead space, but typically you do not see hypercapnia in these patients. And the reason for this is any amount of CO2 rise in a patient with pulmonary embolism will result in higher respiratory rate and thus you can blow off the CO2 from the normal alveoli. A COPD patient also has similar triggers and he will be breathing pretty fast. However, in COPD years, breathing fast is worse because that decreases their expiratory time and thus worsens their auto peep. We talked about this in the previous mechanical ventilation lecture is you can counteract the auto peep by giving them a positive and expiratory pressure. Your EPAP, that is the expiratory PAP or CPAP, can counter the auto peep and it can decrease the work of breathing and decreases the air trapping, thus improving the hypercapnia. All the COPD patients should be given a trial of non-invasive ventilation for hypercapnic episodes. So what are the problem with non-invasive ventilation? The most important is altered mental status, which can be a contraindication for non-invasive ventilator. Though altered mental status would be a contraindication for non-invasive mechanical ventilation, understand that hypercapnia by itself can cause changes in mental status and you have to figure out if the trial of non-invasive ventilation would help these patients. If the patient are delirious and unable to tolerate non-invasive ventilation, you can use drugs like dexmetomidine because this medication can decrease the anxiety without affecting the respiratory system. You can also attempt to use high flow nasal cannula in these patients which can reduce anatomical dead space and decrease work of breathing. However, the effect size for treating the hypercapnia with a high flow is pretty low. Invasive mechanical ventilation can be one of the modalities used in hypoxemic hypoxia from hyperventilation and mostly it is done because hypercapnia has caused their altered mental status. Before you use this, you have to weigh in a lot of factors. The important one amongst them is ability to protect their airways, which you can assess using cough and gag reflex. Look at their risk of aspiration and try to figure out how long you expect the duration of symptoms from the hypercapnia. So for example, if you got a drug overdose from opiates, you know that you can give them narcan, which can reverse these things pretty quickly using non-invasive ventilation and narcan might be a good idea. However, if the patient is still not waking up because he has taken some other drugs and his hypercapnia or altered mental status is going to last for longer period of time, it may be reasonable to intubate them. Always look at the risk of placing your patient on mechanical ventilation. So discuss the risk and benefit before placing somebody on mechanical ventilation. We'll talk more about hypercapnia and ventilation in some other lecture. Thank you.